You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Hey, sports fans, welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, and you're not. I did miss you yesterday. It was weird not doing two shows on a Monday. But like I said, I was just out doing other things, so I appreciate you being understanding of that. You didn't get any NHL picks just because the way that the first round officially ended wasn't conducive to formal picks. The Habs won in the middle of the Islanders-Bruins game. How can I make picks... Under those conditions. It just can't be done. One game... Okay... You can do that. In a perfect world, you wouldn't, but... It's not the end of the world if you do. Two games, forget about it. That can't be done. So what I'm going to do today is react to... All the playoff series, I'll break down an NHL story and eulogize a fallen NBA player. I'm coming back with a banger, so let's get right into it with 76ers Wizards. The big story there is that the Wizards forced a Game 5. Although I will say that's not because of anything the Wizards did. Joel Embiid just got hurt. He will have an MRI today. The Wizards have no shot in this series. It's another instance of a Russell Westbrook team losing in the playoffs. I mean, let's be clear, even though Russell Westbrook had a triple-double yesterday in an elimination game, he did not play well. I don't want to say that triple-doubles aren't impressive, but for Westbrook, it's not enough. We know he can get triple-doubles. He's got to do more. He can't shoot 3 for 19 from the field and tell me that's a good performance. Look, he did a good job setting up his teammates. Seven Wizards, including Westbrook, scored at least 11 points. But again, the only reason that the Wizards won that game was because Joel Embiid got hurt. He only played 11 minutes. If Embiid plays his usual 30 minutes... The Sixers win. It's just that simple. Look at it this way, Sixers fans. You get to see your team win at home. If Embiid doesn't play, and I have no idea if he will, I have no idea if he won't. At this very moment, we don't know either way. You're going to be able to adapt. Doc Rivers will put a game plan in place that makes it so you won't miss Embiid if he sits out. And if he plays, you're going to win by double digits. 
at the risk of getting too cute, I can even make the argument that it's in the Sixers' best interest to hold and be back regardless of what the trainers say. If Embiid plays tomorrow, he's not going to be at 100%. Now that's fine. A less than 100% Joel Embiid is better than most NBA players. But there is the possibility that that injury could be exacerbated. That's the last thing on earth you want if you're the Sixers. Especially given Embiid's lengthy injury history. So you can sit him out a game. Worst comes to worst, he plays game six. But it's not going to get to a game six because now that you've had time to adjust, you can put a game plan in place. And Doc Rivers can change what he needs to change. The Embiid absence won't affect the Sixers that much. The Sixers are fine. Don't worry about them. This has been a joke of a series. Moving on now to Net Celtics. And I give the Nets a ton of credit. They won the game that they needed to win. They lost game three. You know what? Kyrie was rattled. The Jeff Green injury really hurt them. And like I said on this show, Jason Tatum would have a game where he just went off. So it really didn't surprise me that the Nets lost the game. But game four was a must-win game for the Nets. It was a must-win game for the Celtics also, but I'll focus on the Nets since I'm a diehard Nets fan. The last thing on earth you wanted, if you were the Nets was to have this series get boiled down to a best two out of three. You don't want the Celtics to go back to Brooklyn with a ton of momentum. You'd hear all the doubters saying, see, it doesn't matter how much talent you have. If you don't have the time to put it all together, it's not going to work. There's no Iron team. There's only one basketball, blah, blah, blah. Game four was a must-win game, and the Nets ran away with it. The Nets thoroughly outplayed the Celtics. Don't let the final score fool you. This wasn't a 15-point game. This was a 30-point game. The only reason why the Nets ended up winning by only 15 was that the Celtics were excellent from the free throw line. They did a great job drawing contact, although granted the officiating in that game was really, really bad. They were calling everything. They weren't letting these guys play. The Nets and Celtics combined for 72 free throws in Game 4. That's ridiculous. The Celtics hit 38 of their 42 free throws. So let's cut that in half. Let's make it 19 out of 21 free throws. The Nets end up winning by 34 points. That's what this game felt like. It felt like a 34-point knockout. The one thing that this Nets team does really well since James Harden has gotten here, is respond to adversity. After the Pistons loss on February 9th, the Nets had lost four out of their last five. Their defense was dreadful. They couldn't stop the freaking Detroit Pistons. I mean, come on. We talked about the Yankees-Tigers series being bad. 
That Nets-Pistons game was bad. But that loss, in a weird way, helped them. It let them know that they can't just coast by on talent. They need to actually put the work in. They responded by winning 8 straight, 14 out of 15. It was clear that they were a great team. Even the Nuggets game, when the wheels were starting to come off again, it looked like the Nets were going to lose their 5th straight, they may fall to the 3 seed, They were down by 21 in Denver. I turned the game off because I wanted to watch Elon Musk host Saturday Night Live. The Nets rally back to win by six. This team does a fantastic job when they're faced with adversity. They're able to use it as a learning experience, and they just go from there. But that is not the big story in this series. The big story is what happened right after the game. Kyrie Irving was getting booed relentlessly. In games three and four. Every time he touched the ball, he was hearing it. You heard people saying Kyrie sucks. F Kyrie. He didn't appreciate it. No one would. So at the end of the game, after the Nets put a stranglehold on the series, Kyrie went to center court and stomped on the Celtics logo. In response to that, a Celtics fan by the name of Cole Buckley, and his name is out there in public, anyone can see it, threw a water bottle at Kyrie. You remember before Game 3 when Kyrie was concerned about Celtics fans? He was right to be concerned. Buckley was arrested. He's actually out on bail at this very moment. He will be arraigned tomorrow. He's been charged with assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Somehow, some way, Massachusetts law is written in such a way that a water bottle is a dangerous weapon. I'm not defending what Buckley did, but there is no way on this earth that a water bottle is a dangerous weapon. Okay, maybe if it's full, it is. But it was at the end of the game. I think it's fair to assume that the water that was once in that bottle was rushing through Buckley's system. An empty water bottle is not a dangerous weapon. That doesn't mean you should throw it at someone, but it's not a dangerous weapon. A full water bottle thrown at high enough speed, yeah, that can do some damage. Like, I wouldn't want Garrett Cole to hit me in the face with a full water bottle. An empty water bottle, though, you're not going to get too much from that. It's not a dangerous weapon. Okay, let's just make that clear. Massachusetts law is weird. And we know that from what happened with Aaron Hernandez. This is yet another example of misbehavior in NBA games. We've had a bunch of instances of it. Westbrook with the popcorn... Trey Young getting spat on. Emmanuel quickly had a beer bottle thrown at him. Kyrie in the water bottle. John Morant's family was the subject of racial slurs. 
It's absolutely inexcusable. I said this last week. When you buy a ticket and you want to chant this player sucks or this team sucks, that's okay. If you want to say F Altuve, F Kyrie, F whoever, I can live with it. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but you know what? You've got a lot of intoxicated 20 to 30 year olds at sporting events. It's to be expected. I mean, I was at the first Yankees-Astros game. It was the game where Odor and Maldonado had that collision. Incredibly hostile crowd. There was a little kid sitting not that far away from me. I mean, he could hear all the chants. He may have been in an Astros jersey, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. I don't remember, though. I turned to my dad and I said to him, you know what, bringing that kid to this game, that could be a form of child abuse. I mean, you have to know what the crowd is capable of. You're gonna hear swears when watching sporting events. Dropping F-bombs is not the end of the world. You cross the line with racial slurs, there's absolutely no excuse for that. Okay, the fact that I need to say that is ridiculous. There is no excuse to make racial slurs. And for the love of God, you can't go on the court. I mean, my God. How stupid do you have to be to do that? I don't think there's enough alcohol in the world to make me think that it would be a good idea for me to run out onto the court in the middle of an NBA game. I mean, it's bad enough that these guys get on the court. That's a bad job by arena security. The guy could have had a knife. I was at the game where a fan was going after Alex Rodriguez. Like, the guy was going to stab Alex Rodriguez. I was at that game. Fortunately, Yankee Stadium security got to him before any harm was done. But he got onto the field. He got close. There needs to be security blocking every path that could get someone from the stand to the floor. Okay, it's just that simple. Now, I've heard people say... How are we going to stop fans from throwing things? You can't. The only way that you could do it would be to close off part of the arena. But we just got done having empty arena games. You're not going to close off part of the arena Again, unless you need to because of the coronavirus. There's no way to stop fans from throwing something. Even if you wanted to make it so fans could only sit in the upper deck, some of these fans have good arms. Like, I've seen fans throw home run balls from the bleachers to the infield. At a Red Sox game and ended up hitting Giancarlo Stanton. Now that was accidental. But still, the fact that the guy was able to throw a home run ball from, I think it was the Green Monster, to Giancarlo Stanton as he was running the third on a home run. 
That's impressive. There are some things in life that you're never going to remove. Fans throwing things is one of those things. The only way that you could possibly lessen the odds of it, and this is something that I've thought about for a while, we may be getting to this point, Don't serve alcohol in games. Forget just for the fourth quarter. Forget past the seventh inning. No alcohol at games. You want to get drunk before the game? I can't stop you. If you're obviously drunk, you should be denied admission. If you want to get drunk after the game, just don't drive. I mean, I'd love to know if all these fans that we've seen commit these heinous acts at NBA games were under the influence of something. I think it's a fair bet to say they were. I don't know for sure, but I think it's a fair assumption. You want to limit the odds of fans doing something stupid? Don't give them access to a liquid that, when consumed, makes them more liable to do stupid things. I'm willing to try it at this point. Have a game without alcohol. The fans may not like it, but they'll still go to the games. Is that a guaranteed fix? Maybe not, but it's a start. You want to know how to stop fans from throwing things? That's the best bet. There's another element to this, though. And it's so incredibly stupid, I can't even begin to express it. The theory is that because Kyrie stomped on Lucky, the name of the Celtics mascot, at half court, that somehow a justification for a fan to throw a water bottle at Kyrie. Did you go to elementary school? Did you go to middle school? There's no excuse for violence. Are you kidding me? Do I seriously need to tell people this? That Kyrie stomping on the logo in half court doesn't mean that you can throw a water bottle at him? Get upset. Yell at him. That's fine. You paid for your ticket. You can do that. I mean, granted, the yelling is probably what caused that. You got to realize something. Kyrie Irving is a very sensitive person. He may be one of the most sensitive athletes I've ever encountered. Some players can tune out the noise. Others respond to it. So after a whole weekend of hearing chants directed towards him that weren't exactly complimentary, Kyrie Irving made a non-violent gesture. He stomped on a logo at half court. He didn't go after the mascot himself. I don't even know if Lucky was parading around in the TD Garden. But it's not like he went after him and beat the holy hell out of him. He stomped on a logo at half court. Maybe it's not the nicest thing in the world. I mean, if you're a Celtics fan, I understand why you'd get upset. Okay, I remember when Terrell Owens got all the Cowboys fans riled up after running out to midfield and celebrating on the big star. Kyle Turley once threw the helmet of a New York Jet. That drove me nuts. That's one of those things where if you're a fan of the Celtics, it's going to really tick you off. If you're not, it's probably not going to tick you off. But again... Kyrie is a sensitive person. 
It's tough for him to deal with criticism. It's tough for him to deal with derogatory chants. So after a game where he exploded, had a double-double, scored 39 points, he enacted a little bit of revenge on his old team. It's okay. It's not the nicest thing in the world. It's certainly not the classiest thing in the world. I understand why, as a Celtics fan, it would tick you off. It's okay to get ticked off. It's okay to chant. It's okay to tweet about it. But under no circumstances can you throw something at Kyrie. I mean, here's the thing. Who's to say next time it's not a rock or something? What's to say it's not something with a little more girth? These NBA players are going to need to start walking off the court with umbrellas. Is that what we want? I mean, I ask you. It's a joke. You get the sense that these fans are letting out all their pent-up vitriol from not being allowed to attend games for a year. And I get that. No one missed attending games more than me. But I haven't thrown anything onto the field of play. I haven't assaulted anyone. Have I chanted? Yeah, it's okay to chant. But you've got to deal with the repercussions of it. Like, if I'm chanting, Jari, Jari, at the Penguins goalie, there's a chance that that could galvanize him, and he has a Herculean performance. It's also possible that it may motivate someone to go out to the middle of the court when the game is over and stomp on a logo. Actions have consequences. Would I prefer that Kyrie didn't do that? Not really. I really don't care. If the fan doesn't throw anything at Kyrie, we're not talking about it. In fact, it would actually be, in a weird way, kind of an endearing moment to Nets fans. You're stomping on the logo of the team that gutted your future but couldn't seize the moment, didn't make an NBA Finals with those pieces. And the first playoff matchup between those two teams, the Nets are going to win. I mean, yeah, that's a powerful statement right there under that context, stomping on the logo. It's a shame that the game has become secondary But you know what? When the Nets win tonight, that's all anyone's going to talk about. The Nets better win it here. They don't want to go back to Boston. Not after what happened. Win it here. Win it in front of your home crowd. Get a gentleman's sweep. Prepare for the Bucks. Sooner rather than later. Speaking of the Bucks, they clinched their date with the Nets by utterly destroying the Heat. I mean, this is the series that in the Eastern Conference I thought would be the most competitive. Instead, it was the only sweep in the Eastern Conference. In fact, it was the only sweep in the first round of these playoffs. The Bucks just slaughtered the Heat. Game four, the Heat get out to a halftime lead. whoop de do they blow it in the second half. Jimmy Butler with another dreadful game. I mean, if you're a Heat fan, you've got to be furious right now. I know I would be. You're going up against the team that you embarrassed in the bubble. It's okay if you don't win this series. But you've got to make it competitive. Instead, the most points that the Heat scored 
through four quarters was 103. Their offense was inept. You know that Pat Riley is going to blow things up. Dragic is gone. Ariza's gone. Iguodala's gone. Oladipo's gone. Deadman's gone. Oh, this loss would take me off if I was a uh, Heat fan. Now, I've heard some people say that this win was so impressive that they're actually going to change their picks from the Nets beating the Bucks to the Bucks beating the Nets. Look, I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't concerned about the Bucks. Of course I am. Any team with Giannis, I'm concerned about. And I will say this, after watching the Bucks thoroughly destroy the Heat, I'm taking them a little more seriously than I did. It's not like I ever said that the Nets would sweep the Bucks, But I do think the Bucks will really make the Nets work. The Bucks did have a great game plan against Butler and Adebayo. Their defense was immaculate. The question is, can they do that against the Nets? I mean, here's the big difference between the Nets and the Heat. If you shut down the Heat's two best players, you've eliminated their whole offense. If you shut down the Nets' two best players, you still have Kyrie Irving to deal with. Also, you're making a huge assumption that the Bucks will be able to shut down the Nets. I mean, Kevin Durant is a million times better than Jimmy Butler. Durant doesn't have the games that Butler had in this series. Kevin Durant at this very moment is leading the NBA in scoring in these playoffs. Is Giannis going to be able to make Durant work? The answer is yes. There's no question about that. But Durant will still get his. The Bucks will make the Nets work. There's no question. But I still think the Nets are going to win that series. Moving on now to Knicks Hawks. By far and away the most surprising series... In these playoffs. I thought the Knicks would destroy the Hawks. You've got this lethal defense. You've got an all-star in Julius Randle. You have home court advantage. I picked the Knicks in five games. Okay? And no one hates the Knicks more than me. Instead, you end up getting... Utterly creamed by the Hawks in the last two games. Game three, that second quarter was a joke. And game four, that whole game was a joke. Julius Randle, what on earth are you doing? How can you be the best player on a team, be an all-star, and fold like this? That's inexcusable. If it wasn't for the fact that the Knicks had no expectations going into this year, every Knicks fan on earth would be calling for you to be traded. R.J. Barrett is no-showed. I mean, you can't have Derrick Rose be your best player and win a playoff series. This isn't 2011 Derrick Rose we're talking about, where he was the youngest MVP in league history. This is a decade later, multiple injuries later. This is sixth man Derrick Rose. Still a really good player, but he can't be the best player on your team. I mean, here's what's ticked me off more. If I'm looking at this from a Knicks fan's perspective... This Knicks team all year has prided itself on defense. Defense, defense, defense. It doesn't matter that we can't score. We're going to make it so you can't score either. 
In every game in this series, Trey Young has scored at least 21 points. If you're a team that prides itself on defense, especially with an offense that has fallen flat, you've got to do better than that. And that game, when Young only scored 21 points, seven other Hawks scored at least nine points. This vaunted Knicks defense has folded. This Knicks offense has been inept all series. I'll repeat myself. If this Knicks team had any sort of expectation Going into this year, you'd have a lot of ticked off Knicks fans. Now, Knicks fans are looking at this as a building block. Let's use this to improve for next year. It's the right way to look at it. But the simple fact is, the Knicks should have won this series. The Knicks were the better team. I hate the Knicks and I'm saying this. The Knicks are shaping up to be the only Eastern Conference favorite to not make it to the second round. That's a bad look. This has been a dreadful series for the Knicks. The Knicks are well on their way to running New York basketball. Moving on now to Jazz Grizzlies. There's really not much to say about this series. With Donovan Mitchell playing, the Grizzlies have no chance. I said last week that I felt kind of bad for Grizzlies fans because their team gave them a sense of false hope by winning that first game. They thought maybe, just maybe, we could pull off the upset. Not with Donovan Mitchell healthy. Not with him scoring at least 25 points in every game. The Jazz are just light years better than the Grizzlies. It's not even close. This has been kind of a tough series to get into. Especially when you factor in the fact that the three other Western Conference series are all down to best two out of threes. Suns-Lakers, the Suns are making the Lakers work, boy. Let me tell you. Chris Paul finally showed up in Game 4. He had 18 points. Led all Suns in scoring. There are two big stories going into Game 5 tonight. The first one is... That Chris Paul seems to be at 100%. That's a welcome sight. The second one is... That Anthony Davis probably isn't going to play. He is questionable for this game with a groin injury. A report from Shams yesterday said that Davis is... Likely to miss Game 5. Without AD, I don't see how the uh, Lakers win this game. As great as LeBron is, there's no one remotely close to AD in terms of skill level. Dennis Schroeder, no. Andre Drummond, no. Kyle Kuzman, no. Marcus All, no. Alex Caruso, no. Without Anthony Davis, the Lakers are going to lose Game 5. And it'll be a feather in the LeBron haters' cap. Their king, Skip Bayless, tweeted that tonight is the most important game of LeBron's career. It's not. He's played in 10 NBA Finals. I don't know how you can say that a non-elimination game in the first round is more important than 
an elimination game in an NBA Finals. But I will say this. I understand the sentiment. This is an important game for LeBron. LeBron should be expected to take this game over and win. He'll be the best player on the floor. He'll play like 40 minutes tonight. He's got to take over this game if the Lakers are going to win. If the Lakers win, they're up 3-2. They've got a great chance of pulling off the upset. If the Suns win, they're up 3-2. And the road to beating them gets a lot more difficult if you're the Lakers. This isn't the most important game in LeBron's career. It's not even close. But it is important. You would like to see LeBron take over and be a not great Suns team. For the Lakers' sake, I hope that AD plays. If he doesn't, the Suns are going to win. Moving on now to Nuggets Trailblazers. Kind of a weird series. A series that I've had a tough time putting my finger on. One game, the Blazers look like they're exponentially better than the Nuggets. The next game, the Nuggets look like they're exponentially better than the Blazers. Then you have a close game, and then the Blazers blow out the Nuggets. What really hurt the Nuggets... In game four was twofold. Number one, Nikola Jokic wasn't their initiator on offense. It was Facundo Campazzo. Campazzo's not that great. I really haven't been impressed with him this year. You can't have him as the primary ball handler. Is there a role for him? Of course. With Jamal Murray out, he's the best pure point guard that the Nuggets have. But he can't have him be the main initiator. It's just that simple. And number two, Marcus Howard can't try to shoot you out of a deficit. Nikola Jokic led the Nuggets in field goal attempts. And that's fine. That's what he should be doing. You know who was second? Marcus Howard. My guy. This isn't Marquette. Look, I liked watching you at Marquette. You were a good player. And I think you'll be a solid pro. But you can't single-handedly try to shoot the Nuggets out of a deficit. How come Marcus Howard had more field goal attempts than Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter Jr. combined? That's inexcusable. Mike Malone needs to do a better job of reorienting his offense, run it through Jokic, have Porter and Gordon as the second and third bananas, respectively. That's how you'll win this series. Not by Marcus Howard hoisting up 14 shots. That's ridiculous. The last series to talk about is Clippers Mavericks. I've had a fun time with this series. This has been an easy series for me to get into. I mean, I didn't like seeing Luka Doncic try to gut it out with his neck injury and fail miserably. It's the right thing to try to gut it out if you're Luka. Without him, the Mavs lose by 50. But watching him try and fail, that was tough. I mean, as tough as this is... Luca's got to play through it. He's got to play through pain. And he can't take that much of a step back. He can't shoot just 9 for 24 from the field 
and one for seven from beyond the arc. That's not going to work. If you're not 100%, then have him be a decoy. Let Porzingis handle more of the workload. Let Hardaway step up more, although granted he was non-existent in Game 4. Let Dorian Finney-Smith step up. Let Jalen Brunson step up. Although granted, he didn't have a great game either. Let Bobby step up. This was a bad game for the Mavericks. I was a little disappointed in Rick Carlisle. You've got to just use Luka as a decoy if you see that he doesn't have it. You can't let him take 24 shots. And he can't shoot 5 for 30 from beyond the arc and expect to win. The Clippers' defense stepped up. This is what I've been screaming for them to do for a while. They are right back in this series. After falling down 2-0 and headed back to Dallas, I certainly counted them out. But now it's down to a best 2 out of 3. They have home court advantage. It's going to be a really fun game tomorrow. All right, now I'll give you some NHL Volk talk. And I'll start with Bruins Islanders. Don't get me wrong. I am thrilled that they won game two, okay? They needed to win that game. To take four out of five from the Bruins is next to impossible. So they won the game that they needed to win. Give them credit. But, I think it's pretty clear that overall, the Bruins are the better team. Game one was an absolute joke. You get outshot 40-22, to you give up two power play goals. When you only take two penalties in the game. You let David Pasternak get the hat trick. The Bruins were by far and away the better team. Game two was a little closer. But I still feel like overall the Bruins were the better team. It was close. Very, very close. The Islanders should be proud of themselves. Okay, they got to Tuka Rask, and it seems like they found something that works on the power play. The Bruins were the second best team in the NHL this year in terms of penalty kill percentage. They've already given up three power play goals in this series. I mean, you gotta think that Bruce Cassidy is gonna make an adjustment. But he thought that would happen before game two. Cassidy and Kevin Dean need to do a better job. It's just that simple. Look, the Islanders were up 3-1, to one, headed into the third period. A two-goal lead with 20 minutes left to go. Actually, 10 minutes left to go, because the Islanders got through the first half of that period unscathed. The Bruins have no chance, right? Wrong! Semyon Varlamov let the Bruins back into it. Gave up two third-period goals. You can't do that. Ilya Sorokin wouldn't have done that. I'll tell you that. Why did Varlamov get that start yesterday and not Sorokin? I was so upset when I saw that. And after Varley gave up the goal two and a half minutes into the game... Oh, I was ticked off. I thought, here it comes. Here comes the onslaught of goals. It's going to be just like the Golden Knights game. You switch goalies for no reason. To Varley's credit, that didn't happen for most of the game. He just gave up two third-period goals. Skilled teams don't do that. But skilled teams also don't commit a terrible turnover 
on the opposing blue line and give up a breakaway. Jeremy Lozon just tried to go point to point with it. I don't know what the forward was doing there. I think it was Craig Smith. He just got in the way of the pass. The puck deflected out. Sezikis was able to gather it and snipe it past Rask. I mean, give Sezikis credit, okay? Give the Islanders credit. They won. That's all that matters. It's down to a best three out of five. But do you think that's going to happen again, though? You think the Bruins are going to give up two power play goals in the same game again? I think they're going to get their act together. You think the Bruins are going to commit that egregious of a mistake again? I don't think so. Now, granted, that does cut both ways. I don't see the Islanders blowing a two-goal third-period lead again. And I can hear people now, Jacob, take the win. You're an Islanders fan. Be happy. I'm jaded. It's hard for me to get incredibly optimistic about the Islanders. I'm happy that they won. Okay, don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled. I'm elated. They've got a good shot of winning this thing. But it just took a perfect storm for the Islanders to win this game. Two power play goals against one of the best teams in the NHL in terms of killing penalties. And an uncharacteristic mistake by Jeremy Lozon. The Islanders have a chance in this series. Make no mistake about it. You know the Coliseum is going to be rocking. 15,000 fans are going to be in the Coliseum. You're not going to be able to hear yourself think. It's going to be great. I hit on Avalanche Golden Knights a little earlier. Let me put a finer point on it. An absolutely inexcusable decision by Pete DeBoer to put in Robin Lehner. I don't know what that was about. You want to tell me that Flurry was exhausted? You know what? You can rest in the offseason. Okay? This is the playoffs. You can't use rest as an excuse. That would be the equivalent of Carey Price saying, you know what? I just pulled off a miraculous comeback. I'm done. Jake Allen can start game one. You immediately put your team in a hole. The Avalanche are a better team than the Golden Knights. I know that they tied in the standings, but... I do feel like the Avalanche are better. The reason that the Golden Knights finished second in the West was because Marc-Andre Fleury had one of the best seasons of his life. He's a Vesna finalist. That's great. Fantastic. But once you take him out, you're human. And you saw it. Seven goals in game one? How do you throw away a playoff game? That's inexcusable. It's not like you're up 3-0, so you can take it a little easy. This is game one. More often than not, the team that wins game one wins the series. Let me tell you, this is a borderline fireable offense. DeBoer isn't going to be fired. The Golden Knights had too good a season. But this is such a terrible decision that you've got to at least consider that possibility. That may be one of the worst coaching decisions of the year in any sport. Right up there with Lafleur kicking the field goal, depending on how this series unfolds. And also, it's worth noting that Ryan Reeves won't play in games two and three. He was suspended 
for his takedown of Ryan Graves. I'll be honest with you, I didn't have too much of a problem with it. It wasn't the cleanest thing I've ever seen, but it wasn't the dirtiest thing I've ever seen. It definitely wasn't worse than what Tom Wilson did. And yes, that's how we're going to judge these suspensions for a while. I mean, you've got to realize something. That penalty took place when the Avalanche were up 6-1. to one. It was clear that the Golden Knights weren't going to come back. Reeves was ticked off. And he's that type of player. He's a physical player. He's always been that physical player. Look, the cheap shot to Graves to start it off was classless. I didn't like that. But then the headlock and saying something to him and bringing him down to the ground... I really didn't have too much of a problem with that. It's not like he slammed him to the ice. It was a takedown. Make no mistake about it. You're not supposed to do that. I wouldn't have suspended him for two games in these playoffs. You want to suspend him for the first two games of the regular season? I'm okay with that. You want to fine him now? I'm okay with that. A two-game suspension in the playoffs... I don't like that. Bad job by the NHL Department of Player Safety. Moving on now to Lightning Hurricanes. A really great game. Back and forth affair. Very easy to get into. Both goalies made some really nice saves. I mean, to start off the game, you've got Anthony Sorelli getting behind Brady Shea. Golden opportunity, and Nedeljkovic pulls out the flying poke check. One of my go-to moves in NHL 21. Vasilevsky made some really nice saves. His rebound control wasn't that good. So he had to make some second chance saves, which... You usually don't like to see a goalie do. Because those are usually golden opportunities for garbage goals that look the same on the scoreboard. But Vasilevsky made it work. Give him credit. The Lightning got the scoring started with a deflection by Braden Point off a Victor Hedman shot on the power play that somehow scooted by Nedeljkovic. That was a tough goal. He should have had that. But hey, it's one goal. It's on the power play. Not the end of the world. He did stand on his head after that. He made some really nice saves. Then in the third period, the Hurricanes tied it up on the power play. Great job by Jake Bean of putting the puck on net. You never know what will happen. Great job by Jesper Foss at providing the screen. Then in the third period, the Hurricanes just couldn't control the puck. And from a tough angle, you saw Barclay Goodrow convert. This was a very even game. It was a really good game. This is a very easy series to get into. I'm going to be excited to watch it tonight. I'm not going to talk about Jets Canadians. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Instead, I'll talk about Leafs Canadians. The latest chapter in that epic rivalry has been written. The Habs came back from 3-1 down. They were dead to the world. They only scored four goals through the first four. Four games of this series. To put that in perspective, in game two, the Leafs scored five goals. Then the Leafs just folded. Jack Campbell folded, which I didn't see coming. The Leafs defense folded. 
I told you I was skeptical of their defense. This is one of the worst moments in Toronto Maple Leafs history. This is right up there with trading Tuka Rask. This is right up there with the death of Bill Barilko. This is right up there with the Harold Ballard years. This is right up there with trading for Phil Kessel. The Toronto Maple Leafs are the first team in NHL history to lose five straight playoff series. You can set your watch by it. Leaf Elimination Day. The longest active Stanley Cup drought in the league. The second longest drought in the NHL in terms of winning a playoff series. They haven't won a playoff series since 2004 when they beat the Senators in seven games. They are a joke. They've been a joke for years. Serious changes need to be made. I'd love to hear that end-of-season press conference. Every news outlet in Ontario has got to be talking about it. What do the Leafs need to do to win? This is what happens when you steal John Tavares from the Islanders. Payback's a you-know-what. There was another hockey story that I wanted to talk about. It comes from Aaron Portsline of The Athletic. According to him, they are shopping Seth Jones at this very moment and would like to trade him before the draft. Every team in the NHL should be in on Seth Jones. Seth Jones is one of the best defensemen in the NHL. He is excellent offensively. Put up 28 points in 56 games this year. That's a point every other game. From a defenseman, I'll take that. Is he the greatest defensive defenseman in the world? No, but he doesn't embarrass himself out there. And he's young, too. He's 26. Look, John Davidson is back with the Blue Jackets. And he wants to put his stamp on things again. If he wants to blow things up after the season that the Blue Jackets had... I can't say I blame him. This core that the Jackets have just doesn't seem to be working. I mean, you'd get a ton for Seth Jones. You'd get, at the bare minimum, a first-round pick. You may even get an established prospect as well. I mean, that's how great Jones is. I will say this, though, it does speak to an inability of Davidson to keep his superstars in Columbus. Artemi Panarin, superstar, goes to the Rangers. Sergei Bobrovsky, best goalie in free agency, goes to the Panthers. Seth Jones, probably one of the 20 best defensemen In the NHL. It seems like he's gone. He's going to be a free agent. Not this coming offseason. The offseason after. The fact that Davidson. Would rather trade him. Rather than see him walk for nothing. I mean I get that. Because you saw Panarin and Bobrovsky leave for nothing. But again. You can't keep him around long term. It's like the Tampa Bay Rays. It's going to be interesting to see how far the sell-off goes in Columbus. Is Oliver Bjorkstrand next? Is Cam Atkinson next? I wouldn't be surprised, I'll tell you that. Let's see how far John Davidson goes. I do want to talk about the really sad death 
of Mark Eaton, who died on Friday at the age of 64. He was cycling, got into an accident, and died on the side of the road. Mark Eaton is, without question, one of the greatest defensive players in NBA history. He was a mammoth of a man. He knew how to use his height. He was an excellent complement to Carl Malone and John Stockton on those Jazz teams of the early 80s to mid-90s. Really, really good player. But it almost didn't happen. I didn't know this. Thank you, Wikipedia. Mark Eaton was very uncoordinated in his early years. Came off the bench of his high school basketball team. Went to a trade school and became... An auto mechanic. The guy was 7'4 and was fixing cars. Think about that. So an assistant coach at Cypress College. A JUCO in Cypress, California. Convinced Eaton to enroll at the college and try out for the basketball team. He played a couple years there. Transferred to UCLA. He played for Larry Brown. And really didn't play well at UCLA. But what happened was, and again, I didn't know this, so thank you, Wikipedia. Wilt Chamberlain saw Eaton. So here are two giants talking about how to play basketball. Chamberlain told Eaton... To just focus on blocking shots, grabbing boards, and dishing the ball. Don't try to keep up with smaller, more athletic players. That advice proved to be invaluable. Eaton was drafted by the Jazz in the fourth round of the 1982 NBA Draft. The only reason that he was picked was because Frank Layden remembered the old Red Auerbach quote, you can't teach height. He was signed to a big contract right away, five years, $500,000, it's a hundred grand a year for someone who was just viewed as a tall guy that could turn into a defensive specialist. Fortunately for Layden, Eaton made him look very smart. And Frank Layden was a good coach, by the way. Not as good as Jerry Sloan. Sloan was great. Layden was good. I mentioned Frank Layden in my Jerry Sloan eulogy. That just popped in my head, so I wanted to get that out. Eaton immediately proved that he would be that defensive stopper. The thing is, though, the Jazz already had a center in Danny Shays. They didn't want two young centers on the roster, so they traded Shays to the Nuggets for the former net, Rich Kelly. So you have the defensive stopper in Eaton backed up by the offensive-centric Kelly. That was a good job by Layden. Eaton led the NBA in blocks per game four times out of a five-year stretch from 83-84 to 87-88. In 84-85, he averaged 5.6 blocks per game. That is a record that will never be broken. That year, he also set the record for most total blocks in a season with 456. 
neither one of those records will ever be broken. In 88-89, he made his only All-Star team, put up 10.3 rebounds per game. That was only the second year of his career that he put up double-digit rebounds. In 84-85, he put up 11.3 rebounds per game. Let me tell you, Mark Eaton's 84-85 season is without question one of the most dominant seasons in NBA history. We just don't talk about it because it happened on the defensive side of the ball. Eaton spent his whole career with the Jazz. His number was retired. He's in the Utah Sports Hall of Fame. He was a two-time NBA Defensive Player of the Year, three-time NBA All-Defensive First Team member, two-time NBA All-Defensive Second Team member. If Ben Wallace is in the Hall of Fame, Mark Eaton has a great shot of getting in also. Because Eaton was a much better shot blocker than Wallace. Wallace was the better rebounder and was more athletic. But Eaton was the better shot blocker. Now that we've opened up the floodgates with Wallace, Eaton has a great shot of going in. May he rest in peace. Tomorrow I'm going to go back to... Recapping yesterday's games and previewing today's games. I just didn't want to do that today since today's my first day back after the long weekend. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that umpires sometimes get birthday cards. But it's often the same message. It's from people hoping that it's their last one.